and I'll get us going. A very warm welcome again to everyone who has joined us for today's talk. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shirley Gilbert. I'm Professor of Modern Jewish History at University College London, and I'm also the director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, which was established in memory of the late British historian, um, who is no relation of mine. Um, Martin Gilbert, as many of you will know, was a very prolific historian, both the official biographer of Churchill and also published many dozens of books on lots of different topics from the world wars to uh, especially modern Jewish history and the history of Israel. Uh, and so our aim at the center is um, to, to perpetuate his legacy, particularly by being a bridge between the academy, the university and a broad public, uh, because Martin was really a, a very skilled communicator and able to bring rigorous and serious historical research and make it really accessible and exciting to the public. So that is the ethos that underpins our work. And we both do programs like this one. We also run short courses. And um, the, the mainstay of our work is working with schools um, to, to provide secondary schools with resources based on primary materials, based on historians' work uh, to teach uh, modern Jewish history. Um, I will also say again that as a charity, we rely on donations so that we can keep all our events to the extent possible free at the point of access and reach a really wide audience. So any contributions that you might feel moved to make tonight are always very gratefully received and it's very easy to do that on our website. Um, tonight, I am really delighted to be able to introduce Professor Ari Yoshkovitz, um, who is joining us from Vanderbilt U University, where he is the chair of the Department of Jewish Studies. Um, Professor Yoshkovitz is really a, a brilliant scholar whose research focuses on modern Jewish life, and he has always studied Jews um, as part of a broader history of European minorities. Um, his talk tonight is drawn from his new book, which is called Reign of Ash, which looks at the um, interconnections and entanglements between Jews um, and one particular minority, and that is Romanis, so-called gypsies. Um, through the 20th century and particularly during the Holocaust. Um, and, I, you know, I can say that as a historian of the Holocaust, this is really a crucial and woefully understudied aspect of the history, since we know that fully a quarter to a half of the Romani population in Europe at that time were murdered by the Nazis, and yet their history has remained relatively undocumented compared to the ways in which uh, the Jewish genocide has been documented. Um, so we are really privileged to be able to hear more about it tonight. Um, and also, I will mention that the book won the prestigious Frankel Prize, which is awarded by the Wiener Holocaust Library in London annually for the, the best book in Holocaust studies. So a big congratulations on that. Um, Ari will be speaking tonight for about 40 minutes. And after that, as usual, we will have time for your questions and comments. Feel free to post those in the general chat or post them to me privately in the chat or put up your hand. Um, and Ari will be pleased to answer those questions after the talk. Uh, so without any further ado, I will pass over to you, Ari. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for this introduction as well. Um, it's it's great to speak at a at a center like this um, that is really broadly um, educating uh, people on Jewish history and on the Holocaust. I myself has all have also been teaching the Holocaust for the past two decades. Um, and as I was doing that, um, at some point I was thinking about what it means to move beyond what I what I know best, and that is well, Jewish history and the persecution of the Jews. Um, and I started to wonder about my ability to actually teach about the persecution of other groups. Um, so it's in this context that I came to ask these two, two, big, two bigger questions, um, which is how do we really learn about the suffering of other groups, especially about those about whom we know very little? And then what are our responsibilities? An ethical question. What are our responsibilities towards these other groups? Um, well, you, you, you know already from, from the title of this talk um, and, and, the, and the introduction about, about the other group I, I, I ended up studying. Um, and I see it also in the title of my talk. I am interested in, in two groups, Jews and Roma, tied together by, by one event. Um, and of these, right, these two, these three terms, Jews, Roma, Holocaust, it's the term Roma that usually raises most, most questions. 
So let me very briefly um, just say a few words about, about the Romani people. So Roma, or also in, in the UK, Romanis are a group um, of about 10 to 12 million people globally. Um, they were historically called, uh, called gypsies. Um, Self-description of some groups actually still in the UK, for example. But when we speak about the whole group in sort of umbre as an umbrella term, uh, the, the, the preference is, is clearly to speak of, of Roma. Um, Romani people are incredibly diverse, um, and they're diverse on many levels. So we can think of religion. They very often have the religion of their neighbors, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox Christians, Muslims. Um, there is, I believe, an image of Roma as itinerant, um, you know, the, the, the caravan, the, the wagon as, as, as an image um, of, of you know, traveling as families. And there were groups historically uh, who have traveled, um, but uh, certainly by the time of the Holocaust, um, the vast majority of Roma would have been settled across Europe. Um, Finally, there are well, the other elements that actually bring them together. Among them is uh, a shared identification with a language. There is a language called Romani. Um, many Romani groups will speak that language. Others have lost it over time or have not spoken it for a very long time, like Gitanos in, in Spain, say. Um, it nevertheless, even though not all groups speak it, it, it is an identifying factor for all groups, as is tradition. Um, even though here again, there are diverse traditions and also diverse subgroups who may not necessarily um, accept the traditions of the other groups or, or, for example, find if they're traditionalists, find intermarriage uh, to be something they would they would endorse. So it's a very diverse group. And you will not be surprised that that diversity will also lead to a diversity of terms that exists, um, how people describe themselves and I already mentioned the word Roma. There's one more term that I want to introduce you to, and that is the word Sinti, which are, Ro who are Romani people who live mostly in German lands, uh, also in, in, in Scandinavia, in so France, in Northern Italy. Um, and many Sinti will understand themselves part of the Romani people, but as distinct from Roma, whom they see as their um, Eastern European brothers and sisters. Um, so this is relevant because I will speak about the Holocaust, which starts takes its starts in Germany, and thus the, the way German groups describe themselves has 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 some relevance. And when I know I'm speaking about Sinti, I will um, yeah, use that term. Um, so as you as you as you know also from the introduction, the Jews and Roma were both victims of Nazi persecution. Um, and it is indeed the case that their story is much more rarely told. Um, but it's not just that their history as victims of persecution is not told, that is victims of Nazi persecution. What we really are missing is pretty much all of their history. I am pretty sure, um, you know, whatever textbooks you had in school, what you've seen in museums, um, if we've traveled also to places where Roma are a substantial minority, that they will not have shown up in, in sort of national history museums. Um, all of this is, is surprising if we consider that Roma are likely the largest ethnic minority of Europe. So what does it say about our somewhat impoverished understanding of European history that its largest minority is not represented in any form, really? In, in, in crucial places. So my own attempt to overcome all of this, to think about the Romani genocide, Romani history more broadly, is through the lens of the relationship of the group and the people to Jewish history and to Jews. And I do this in part for the biographical reasons that I hinted at. I'm trained as a historian of the Jews. But it's much more. And so what I want to convince you today, what I want to convince you of, is really that there are ways in which their history is connected in perhaps some expected ways, but also in ways that are unexpected. So, so to do this, let me first take you to a place where uh, Romani history is, is remembered. Um, and that is 
this place here, which is uh, the Documentation and Cultural Center of German Sinti and Roma. Um, it's the first real permanent exhibition on Romani history and the Romani genocide uh, created anywhere. So it was a larger institution. Um, it was opened in 1997. And you know, there are school groups going through this building. Uh, there are tourists who will go there um, when they visit Heidelberg. Um, and if you enter this building, this is the sentence that you'll see. So the very first thing you will see is this sentence um, from by, by the German president, Roman Herzog, uh, something he said when the exhibition was opened. The genocide against the Sinti and Roma was executed with the same motive of racial hatred, with the same intention, and the same will to systematically and definitively exterminate as the genocide against the Jews. The same sentence uh, was also is also at the um, exhibit that you will find at the memorial site in Auschwitz-Birkenau. So there are different pavilions there with separate uh, exhibits, and this will also greet you there. This, this sentence was also discussed uh, briefly um, as uh, an inscription to a central monument that was to be built in Berlin that also exists now, a monument to the murdered Sinti and Roma of Europe. And um, ultimately a different sentence was discussed. But um, in all these aspects, it shows you how central the murder of the Jews is for communicating about the murder of the Roma. And if we just, you know, just as a thought experiment, it's useful to, to remember, um, to think how impossible it would be to think of the inverse, right? It shows us this dependence. Um, you know, the, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, or the Wiener Library in London, you know, if you, if you enter it, you would never have a sentence about the genocide against the Jews was executed with the same motive of racial hatred as the murder of the, of the Roma. It, it would make no sense. Um, it's the better known that explains the lesser known genocide. And this asymmetry, while it might seem obvious to us, is nevertheless, it's something we should note. And it's it's quite quite crucial for how we should, how we would want to, to think about these two genocides, especially because it goes beyond issues of representation. So uh, say you were interested in researching the Romani Holocaust and you wanted to turn to, you know, you want to hear what the voices of victims. You might be interested in listening to their testimonies. What would you do? Well, uh, the largest testimony archive, uh, audiovisual testimony archive that we have is the Shoah Foundation. Um, it has over 50,000 interviews with Jewish survivors. It's enormous. Um, it has some other groups and it has 406 interviews with Roma and Sinti. Now, over 50,000 to 406 might sound like that is, it's a very, it's really a minor part of their archive. But those 406 audiovisual testimonies in one place still make it the largest collection of Romani testimonies anywhere. Um, so this this raises some, it, it really raises some interesting Questions: what, what do we do when institutions really created to commemorate the fate of one group represent and in some cases literally own the history of the fate of another group, the, the, the artifacts, the traces of their history? So one thing that will happen when when we when we start in this manner, when we try to think about two genocides, is that that we will start to compare. Um, and to some degree, I think there's I, I don't want to universally speak against comparisons because it's really how we humans make sense of the world. It's how we gauge who we are in a social group, um, whether it comes to you know status, salaries, um, or uh, indeed hierarchies of stigmatization. Um, that is true also for the victims themselves when they were you know, in camps and looked across the literal or metaphorical barbed wire fence. They were trying to figure out where they were in, 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 the, in the, if you want the hierarchies of hell, um, what, what their fate was going to be. So there's something I, very, I think, very natural 
about the way we want to understand the world by comparing, but there are also some issues with it. So what are the issues with it? Well, the first is comes to how we how we introduce things really, and how we how these grand comparisons that we can, might make about two genocides, um, how they may seem to be about empirical matters, but once we ask why we are comparing these things rather than other things, there is no more empirical way of actually answering the question. So one way that the Romani Holocaust will very often be introduced, um, and Professor Gilbert actually did not use the, those terms, um, but I think what, what is very often will happen is that people will say, well, six million Jews died, and then it will struggle to find good numbers for, for the Romani genocide, which has less reliable numbers. And estimates will be somewhere between 120,000 and half a million. Those, those most, most estimates will fall somewhere in this range. And that, that seems like a perfectly fine empirical statement. But um, why not instead indeed go for percentage numbers? I'll just give you an example. Uh, I grew up in, in Austria. Uh, in Austria, um, 64,000 Jews were murdered and 9,000 Roma, again, approximately. So again, you would have a disparate numbers here in the way that match the, the overall numbers as well. If we go by percentage of, uh, of the individuals in the community murdered, you'd have somewhere around 30% um, of Jews who were murdered and 80% of Roma. Now, one thing you can notice here is that, you know, which, which what, you, what you use um, makes a big difference. But the second thing you notice, the minute I, I, start, I start doing this in this form is that at least this is what I experience, and I ex presume some of you do too, there's a deep discomfort <laughs> that we're actually playing number games that are wrong. That And I, I could, you know, I, I sometimes imagine what would happen if I told my grandparents who were Holocaust survivors something like that, something of what I just told you. I think they would just stare at me and try to say, what, what are you trying to do? <laughs> I have no idea why you're making <laughs> making these, these you know, wh what's the point of these number games? Um, so ultimately, what, what I take from that is that when we start to do these types of comparisons, what we often end up doing in reality is minimizing the suffering, sometimes the suffering of others or the suffering of both groups, in fact. There's also the problem about how we decide in reality um, rather than in the abstract about what to compare. And here, um, the track record isn't particularly good. The first groups really to the first institutions that tried to compare what happened to Roma and what happened to Jews were courts. And courts had to do this to adjudicate uh, claims for compensation. Um, they came up with very rigid frameworks for saying, you know, this happened to Jews, this happened to Roma, and uh, thus, you know, well, whereas we already established a standard for compensation for Jews, here it differs sufficiently that they that they should not get any compensation. So comparisons ultimately had a had a purpose, if you want, a purpose of excluding one group from another. So, um, well, I think you've heard me now for, for 12 minutes. Clearly, I have more to say about it. So if we're not comparing, what am I doing the rest of the time? <laughs> and my answer is, um, we shouldn't be so much comparing, but understanding relationships. Relationships between actual people in at the time and when they are trying to overcome that history. So when I say related, I don't just mean happy interrelations. I also mean misunderstandings, ignoring each other when one is next to each other. So it's it's not just a happy story, it's a complicated story, but it nevertheless is one of relationships. So so let me let me turn to the beginning of my story, really, and the beginning for my purposes, um, which could be many places, but for my purposes, it's the Nazi era. It's when this this it, it's when the when sentences like the one you just saw earlier introducing um, that exhibit when they started to make could have possibly started to make sense to people. So, if we start with the Nazi era and we just look at the earliest period, so the first six years, 1933 to 1939, before World War II, this is Nazi Germany with in its borders still mostly, I mean, there's already expansion, Austria, Sudetenland, um, 
but it's pre-World War II, um, and there is no genocide yet. There is massive persecution. Their Jews are being expropriated. They're isolated. Uh, they're forced into immigration. There's violence on the street, but it is not yet uh, genocidal violence. So if we look at this period, and we look at sources from the time, you would not know that Jews in Roma were persecuted next to each other. You would not find sources where one group really in, identify, in, in ways that identify with the other group, highlight what happens to the other group. So say you read Jewish newspapers, both in Germany, they're censored, but also outside of Germany, where they are not censored in that regard. You would not know, for example, that the first group to really uh, face um, internment as a whole racialized group of these two would be Roma, starting in 1936. And what we what we find are camps like this one. This one is in Berlin, um, Camp Marzahn. Um, these are camps established starting 1935, but really around 1936, the Berlin Olympics are crucial. They're camps established by municipalities at the outskirts of cities um, as we want semi-open areas where Roma are forced to live. So called, uh, what they would call a gypsy camp. Um, and these camps would eventually play a role also as persecution would you know, uh, become more intense and eventually all the way to deportations. If Jews noticed what was happening here, they probably understood it. It's just like their neighbors did. Um, their non-Jewish neighbors did as an extension of longstanding policies. Um, to some degree, with groups that are so profoundly marginalized, um, these types of policies seemed business as usual. But like business as usual, whereas, for example, boycotting Jewish stores might were, was much more obviously a radical departure of how things had been. There is a state that is a state boycott, as you would have on April 1st, 1933. There was also German Jews indeed had very good reasons and were rightly thought that they would not end up in a so-called gypsy camp on the outskirts of cities. It was not part of their experience and their fears. And as a result also, it would not be part of the histories that Jewish survivors would write, either as memoirs, but also some of the first historians of the Holocaust were themselves survivors. They would not have it in there. Others who are not Jews or not survivors would nevertheless eventually start to use victim testimonies in some form or you know, rely on what victims said to understand what is relevant. So for all these reasons, these experiences of the past meant that it didn't show up in the historiography either, in the way history was written. So when we tell the chronology of the Holocaust, when you you know you have a you know a simple if it's a monument, if it's a museum, these camps would not show up in the chronology, and that's a result of the experiences that people had at the time of whether they would you know would perceive this to be part of their story. Now all of this did change with the beginning of the war, and with the radicalization of policies. Eventually, once we get to the period of genocide, say forty one to to, to to 45, certainly, um, we um, we see that Jews in Roma are never completely separated in this process of, of extermination, even though the Nazis sometimes try to separate groups. Ultimately, they see each other suffer. The place where this happens in the most tangible way and most famously is perhaps Auschwitz-Birkenau, where the so-called gypsy camp um, is uh, is pretty much uh, right uh, next to the, the famous ramp, the infamous ramp, where uh, after May 1944, also Hungar built for Hungarian Jews, and where, where the selections would take place, um, they would be the last victims who would see these other victims alive. Um, and those would sometimes be memories that uh, focus on on the auditory, uh, sorry, on the on the visual, uh, also on other uh, other sentences senses. And indeed, the auditory has a has a massive role here. A lot of Jewish testimonies of Roma actually are about the the auditory aspect. So this includes uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, where uh, 
Roma and Sinti, this, this camp that I mentioned uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, where Roma will be interned, um, so which is called the so-called Gypsy Family Camp. Um, the, it, the, the, those who remain there, over 4,000 prisoners, will be murdered in a single night on August 2nd, 1944. And many Jews remember this as one of the, or the worst night in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and what they remember, what they can remember are the screams. It's, it's, a, it's a deeply auditory memory. Very similar, there was the large ghetto, second largest ghetto in Poland, um, had uh, for a period of about uh, one and a half months, uh, had a so-called gypsy camp or gypsy ghetto uh, carved out of it where 5,000 Roma from Austria were deported. Um, and what Jewish, what many, many Jewish testimonies remember of people who were in the large ghetto is simply the screams. They could not identify the language even. What they remember are horrible screams they cannot identify. And all of this left really indelible marks, I would say, on, on the survivors. That was even more the case, I would say, when you dealt with, um, with other senses, smell, but also tactile uh, interactions, burying each other's dead, and uh, being forced to deal with each other's property. Now, when I describe all of this, I also want to point out a paradox. Uh, the people who had these experiences, who remember the screams of the other group, remember the other group walking to their death, very often after the war expressed deep solidarity with these with with the, with other victims. While they expressed deep solidarity, at the same time, it was what they witnessed did not tell them a whole lot about how these people lived. They learned of the other group's death, but not about their life. The people who did, you know, who might have been able to name a member of the other group, for example, they if they had personal contact, sometimes did build personal friendships as well, but just as often or more often ended up in a deeply antagonistic relationship to the other group. And that had to do with the fact that the reason they were interacting was very often because the Nazis forced them to interact in a particular way, because they were set up to manage the other population. The most famous instance when this happened is when Jews from northern Transylvania, what is now Romania, was then also annexed by Hungary. These Jews were deported from there to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And for about two weeks, uh, Sinti Kapos were in charge of them. And the, the memory that they have would be of, of violence. And the most famous person to experience this would be Eli Wiesel. Um, so this is just a very short section from Elie Wiesel's famous night, uh, which I have here in the English translation, and this is the, the, the Yiddish uh, original, which also has it. And, and he recounts how his father asks politely in German, excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? And then he says, the gypsy stared at him for a long time from head to toe. And then eventually, then as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. And it's, it's actually a crucial part of Elie Wiesel's narrative when sort of in the narrative, the way he structures it, he, he realizes that, that he's helpless in, in, in the face of violence. He cannot defend his father. Um, so memories like this would have, you know, would also be amplified by certain memoirs, by communities of memory. Um, ultimately, they, they might also, you know, we, we hear... Jewish memory of this violence dominates, even though um, I would say that there is an equal number. Um, it's actually more more common that Roma would end up being you know, managed, forced, where, where Jews would be forced to manage the affairs of Roma simply because most Roma were deported to places first created to persecute Jews. That's a matter of practicality for the Nazis. So what do we learn from this? From, from all of these interactions during the war, for me, there are three things really. Um, the Well, the first has to do with this issue of solidarity that I already mentioned. It's an inverse relationship. 
Knowledge and solidarity don't go together easily. Very often, those who ended up with more knowledge showed less solidarity. Those who knew less but had particular types of, of, of impressions ended up expressing more solidarity. This would be this would be quite a complication, of course, when you have you know Jewish testimonies be which are dominant and 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 you know who would be asked about their experiences with Roma, who would be able to report on them, and what you know, and and to what degree are those who speak most <laughs> out of their interactions actually representative of of the larger group? But the second thing we can learn here is something that goes back to what I said about comparisons as well. Really, comparisons usually work in this grand manner, sort of out of Berlin. What did the Nazis think about Jews? What did they think about Roma? And from everything I said so far about their interaction during the war, what you can see is it's local. It's it's there, there are pragmatic reasons that the Nazis make certain decisions. Um, the relations between these two groups are really hardly ever the result of central policies. So we can we can see how moving beyond these, if we want to understand actual experiences of each other's suffering, we have to move beyond comparisons. And then third, what you can see here is that Jews and Roma suffered mostly next to each other, not with each other during the war. What would bring them together is not so much simply the experience of both being victims, but rather the shared attempt to record and repair that injustice. So let me let me now turn to those to precisely that that moment. And to do that, I want to start us off with a with a puzzle, a document that I found fascinating and puzzling. And that's that's um, you know it's a, it's a puzzle I'll, I'll I'll share with you. And this is a document that I found in the Jewish Community Archives of Vienna. Um, it's next to a whole lot of documents uh, of lists that the Jewish community held. Um, you can imagine it. These are all they all deal with 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 Jewish survivors. Um, uh, the the list right next to this one is actually the um, the list of of Jews deported for three to three and a half years to concentration camps, which which included my my paternal grandmother. Um, this is the only list in this whole collection of lists that does not deal with Jews. Instead, it is called the list of Gypsies registered with us. Um, and I can. I can tell you something. So it's a, it's a list of 33 individuals. Um, most of them share uh, last names. And they're basically two larger families, Gusak or Husak, and then Horvat. And it's really two people who bring these two families together. And I can tell you a bit about them. Uh, one of them is Adolf Hosak, um, who, uh, who would come together after the war with Hermine Horvat. And, and, and they both lost everything during the war. Gusak lost his wife and son. Uh, Horvat, her parents and four siblings in the camp. Uh, they both had nothing to return to. Gusak never had anything to begin with. Horvat um, owned a tiny house, which they did not receive back when neighbors took it. Completely typical story. Um, in the summer of 1946, they ultimately made their way to Vienna from the countryside and tried to get their history certified, clearly. Um, they... Um, where could they go? Well, there was a central association, actually, of survivors of all persecution, which wasn't particularly friendly to Roma. And there was a group that was certifying, in particular, racial persecutees, persecutees founded by the Jewish communities because these types of persecutees were generally excluded. So when Roma came to Vienna, the place where they would certify is so have their, their fate certified want to be on a list. It is That was a list created by an institution, ultimately, that the Jewish community had established to help Jews. And it makes a whole lot of sense in many respects. Um, it makes a, some, respect, some sense because of the commonalities they had with other people on these other lists. Jews in Roma had some similar experiences of liberation. They both, both Members of both groups, first of all, when they when they were liberated or returned home, tried to figure out if any relatives are alive. Uh, then they both, as they were doing this, both members of both groups realized they're not welcome. Uh, neither anti-Romani sentiment nor anti-Semitism went away. Right, people were not happy to see them back. Um, 
But as much as that was a commonality, there were also great differences between them. And one of them uh, was that uh, Jewish organizations uh, had existed for a long time and could help Jews beyond the family networks that they had. And the most important one of these was, was an American institution, the American Joint Distribution Committee, founded in 1914 to help Jews during World War I, um, which fed much of European Jews. Um, so Roma did try to access these resources too. I have very nice testimonies from, from, from German Sinti who pretended to be Jews with fake ID cards as well. And they say they, they enjoyed Yiddish theater in DP camps. Um, so that was one element of it. And then the second one was indeed that they would go to Jewish institutions to get certified. So this was in a way a first step um, in the in the longer path that Jews and Roma that, that Roma would have in connecting to Jewish networks. Ultimately, what would bring them together even more would be the need that Roma had to find some real documentation for what happened to them. So it's one thing to individually be on a list, but be on a list of what? This list doesn't tell, yet tell a state administrator what happened to them. So how do we get from here to, to something more? And here I want to um, introduce you actually to a British art historian. I want to introduce you to uh, a man who uh, nearly wrote a book. So I want to tell you about a book that wasn't written. But this is the type of book that wasn't written that actually has an author. So I'll tell you the, the name of the author of the book that wasn't written is Gerald Reitlinger. So Gerald Reitlinger was um, the scion of a British uh, banking family. Um, he wrote a very important book in 1953 called The Final Solution, which was really the first um, major history of the Jewish Holocaust, I would say. A book um, that well, you know, German prosecutors would give each other when they tried to figure out what happened during the war in their attempt, when they when they tried to put you know Nazis on trial. Uh, Reitlinger would write several other books uh, related to, to the topic, one on the SS as well. And uh, he could rely on institutions to do that. Uh, in London, the Wiener Library in London, we, we know very well how much support he got from that library because he was sitting on his estate and, and getting books from there. And much of the correspondence in the Wiener Library consists of them complaining that he's uh, getting books delivered and never returns them. So we know exactly how much he used them. Um, he also had a wonderful publisher uh, by the name of uh, George Weidenfeld, uh, later Baron Weidenfeld. Uh, George Weidenfeld was a Jewish emigrate from Vienna um, who in the late 1950s um, had made some very good uh, decisions, uh, publishing decisions. Uh, he published Nabokov's Lolita, which was prohibited in the United States uh, and uh, thus sold very well. Um, so. Weidenfels was interested in history. He had an author who had written on the Jewish Holocaust. He had uh, funds. And he told his author, why didn't you write a history of the Romani genocide? So how do you write a history of the Romani genocide in the late 1950s? Well, Weidenfels had some connections. He had another author in Vienna uh, who was the head of the International Auschwitz Committee. A survivor organization of all those who had been in Auschwitz, really the biggest of these survivor organizations. And uh, so Weidenfels put his two, you know, clients and, and authors in, in touch with each other. And Reitlinger asked Langbein for help, saying, you know, do you have an archive? Can, 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 can you help me? Uh, we can see uh, the responses that he got um, because uh, Langbein told Reitlinger, well, we don't, you know, Responding to your letter, I have to repeat that currently material about the fate of the gypsies in Auschwitz is not available in a collection. And we know from Langbrand's correspondence with Weidenfeld, then, uh, well, that uh, he, uh, well, Reitlinger decided, well, if there is no, if there is no, no archive there, then I'm not writing a book. Um, Langbein was uh, was pretty upset about this. He wasn't just upset because he realized how lazy historians sometimes are. Uh, he was upset uh, because he knew what it would mean, what it would mean for the people he was working with, Roma and Sinti, who were trying to get compensation claims uh, adjudicated, for example, if they had a book to show, if they had a book like The Final Solution, 
that they could show to an administrator and say, this is a real history that we experienced. How did this change? Well, it was again, Jewish archives actually that would change all of this. Um, who would start collecting the testimonies that Reitlinger was looking for. Um, and actually the, the, the Wiener Library in London was one of these institutions that, that was crucial here. Um, uh, one of the people involved here is this uh, this one this lady uh, uh, Eva Reichmann, uh, another emigre from Germany and a visionary figure, I would say. Um, when she started collecting testimonies in the 1950s, uh, late 1950s, again, um, she explicitly asked for testimonies of of Roma, or she would have she called them gypsies. Um, so uh, you might wonder how I was able to tell you about these two people on the list earlier. That's because the two people on that list who happened to also be on a list also then gave testimonies in Austria to the Wiener Library. Um, and here you have the, you know, here you have the list, uh, here, here you, well, the, the document. Uh. I also, you know, put on the slide how much they were paid. And I, uh, you know, that the Wiener Library paid $150 for it. Uh, and I did this very consciously. Um, I did this because um, we forget perhaps what it really took for me to find this document and to bring it to you. Um, we may think of this history as, you know, somebody had a good idea, somebody realized there's some bit, some a story to be told and then they just told it and that now we have it. But really what it took was an infrastructure. It took people who cared about the story, who were trained to ask about the story, would send this testimony to London where there were three people indexing actually, uh, testimonies overall, but, and then the institution had to archive it and it had to survive, which wasn't obvious either. All, all these institutions were really uh, struggling to survive and, and had very little money. So for this story to come to me, what it took was ultimately an institution like the Wiener Library with the community support that it could muster to allow the Romani stories to appear. And eventually the book that Reitlingen perhaps should have written was written in 1972. It was published as The Destiny of Europe's Gypsies, published by well, uh, Donald Kenrick and Grattan Puxen. Um, and it was published with support from the Wiener Library once again. Um, so, all of this um, tells us a story really of that knowledge that gets con that where, where there's a deep asymmetry, but a deep connection as well between how those two events are commemorated. And these asymmetries haven't gone away. And here I'll just fast forward all the way to the present. Um, I, you know, the examples I mentioned uh, about the, the Shoah Foundation and the interviews suggests to us that, you know, that hasn't gone away. But what has gone away is that there is a way to actually talk about it, that Jewish and Romani young people, young activists in particular, have more and more of a sense of something shared. And many of them also start to have ever more similar experiences of, of growing up and of professionalizing, actually. Um, especially when they start working for NGOs and, and you know, go through the similar um, unpaid internships and, 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 and all the things one goes through as one, as, as one you know, becomes an, an adult in, this, in, the, in the, the larger NGO world. I'll just illustrate, what we can also see is there's a new level of reciprocity that emerges. I'll just show you very, two very short examples. The internet is a wonderful way to research these things. Um, what you can see here is the, Romani student organization Ternipe, one year after a terror attack in Germany, um, commemorating that terror attack and linking to the Jewish students of Germany, um, you know, showing solidarity with uh, Jewish students and Jewish citizens. And a few months later, the Jewish students of Germany would like uh, Hanukkah candles for the Jewish holiday where eight candles are being lit and for each candle they they dedicate each candle to a to a human rights cause, and here they you know they reciprocate by dedicating it to Roma and Sinti. Um, perhaps even more you know, tangible is this example here. This is after COVID. Um, there was 
big concern about marginal communities and the health care they would receive. Romani communities were among those that were, were really uh, imperiled in, in particular ways. So here, Jewish, the European Union of Jewish Students and a Romani organization, Pira Namenka, wrote to various uh, EU um, institutions um, advocating for Romani health care and ended their letter together with join us in standing in solidarity with Roma in times of crisis. Jewish rights are Roma rights and Roma rights are Jewish rights. As I said, the asymmetries haven't gone away, but I just want you to, to you know, if we just stop for a second and remember where we started, how I told you about the beginnings in the Nazi era, not recognizing each other's suffering all the way to today, as paradoxical as this may sound, I think it's actually a hopeful story <laughs> of, of, of developing new forms of expressing solidarity. Um, ultimately, um, my own book actually comes out of this, this conversation that starts here, started between Romani and Jewish activists. I think I could not have written my own book without it. Um, I hope what this talk did, what my book does, is to describe what is a unique story to some degree, a unique story of proximate suffering that also raises questions, broader questions about the general responsibilities we have towards each other's histories. And I hope it's an opportunity to rethink what it means to have unequal alliances when really there are just no other alliances to be had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari, for a really engaging talk and for, for finishing on a hopeful note. Um, <laughs> we have time now for questions and comments. There are a couple of questions in the chat, which I will um, convey to Ari. Feel free to add more. Um, but I wanted to start with one of my own, and I, it's a question really, or a pair of questions about the politics of who writes or owns history. And it's really, you know, um, building on or kind of um, uh, reflecting on what you said. Um, you talked about how many of the early historians of the Holocaust were survivors, um, especially Jewish survivors, and also the infrastructure of memory that you described. You know, you mentioned the Wiener Library, you mentioned the Shoah Foundation and others, which are Jewish initiatives. And I wondered if you could say something about the Roma counterpart to that effort or really why there wasn't that counterpart and why it, why it needed to, to um, ally with the Jewish initiatives. And then related to that, what responses there might have been to you as a Jewish scholar writing about Roma and being the one to, to bring this history more to light? Yeah, um, so at the, so the just in terms of when when does so so Romani organizing on a national level, I would say, starts to some degree in the interwar period in, in, in small ways in different places and where it, it struggles from the very beginning with the diversity of the community. Um, eventually, by the 1970s, there are 1960s, really, I mean, 1970s on a larger scale, there's international organizing as well. Um, and it's that civil rights movement that will actually very much start to interact with these Jewish efforts as well. So I do want to emphasize there is a there is certainly a, a Romani story here as well. Ultimately, they are a profoundly marginalized community. Um, they are a, and, and, and so so some of their story, right? If we if we look at the different um, different victim groups of of, of Nazis, um, I, I would say. But the the opportunities to commemorate are, are are fairly distinct. If we think of of homosexuals who were persecuted, for example, what they struggled with is that they, well, one of the things they struggled with is that they their their what homosexuality was criminalized before and after the war. So in Germany, it's called Paragraph One Seventy Five. Um, it existed before, existed after. So you know, if you tell the story of being persecuted because you fall under that paragraph, you're still, you know, you, you, you're acknowledging to have committed a crime um, until the 1970s when these, when they were abrogated, in this case, in West Germany. Um, uh, and there's something of this in, when it comes to Roma, being Romani itself technically is not illegal, but the term gypsy is a police term as well. Um, and it is used to to marginalize these communities. And this is where it's not just a failure of, you know, 
you want mainstream society to to accept them, it's the other victims as well, um, who are who are seeing them as as people they don't want to associate with, much like homosexuals. Then again, where they are very different from homosexuals is homosexuals had uh, you know were often ostracized by their own communities, whereas Romani Roma did create their own memory communities and you know, have a familial memory and, and a communal memory around these things. Um, what it did not translate into is, is the sort of thing that ultimately is, is very, you know, it's, it's what I mentioned about the infrastructure. It's, it's a very peculiar thing. Um, and I may, and, well, I mean, one question one should really ask is, is the Romani example the exception? Is the Jewish example the exception? Um, Jews were really become the model for so many other groups in the way they will commemorate um, their, their, their suffering. Um, so, so, so I would say part of it really has to do with, with a deeply marginalized community that faces over-policing, criminalization throughout, and whose narrative is very different in some respects. Uh, if you just look at the way you would, you would narrate persecution, one, one thing, the, the Shoah Foundation is, is you know, th th there's, a, there's a pattern to how you're supposed to interview. And the Shoah Foundation as a big institution formalized this, which is, you understand that the thing you're supposed to ask about is the Holocaust, and the narrative will be something about maybe well maybe there was some anti-Semitism, but generally you were you were free before, then the Nazis either come to power or invade, and then uh, you know you lose your rights, you somehow survive, to be able to tell the story, and then there's liberation again. It's not a happy moment actually, as we know now, but 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 there is a there's a, there's an end, and then and then you are citizen again. That's not the case for Romani stories necessarily. Certainly, they're not murdered before or after, but they their internment starts earlier sometimes. It also doesn't end in peculiar ways. I found the French example to be fascinating here. Uh, France has its own internment in in in, in camps that that are run by the so called prefecture, the prefecture the, of, of police. They they will sentence release Roma before the before liberation, but other groups, even after relation. Right. Much of France is liberated by by the summer of forty four. Really, um, they will they will they will let they will only liberate Roma by nineteen forty six, and will say, well, you know, these people are considered criminals. They're regular criminals. This is not racial persecution. We still want them, you know, confined. Um, so that's a very different story, I would say, and one that 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 is somewhat difficult to tell for for the survivors. So there th there was definitely a different relationship to. To who wanted to hear that story, how it could be told, and 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 here Jewish archives both worked to highlight their stories, but also clearly also created new misunderstandings very often, I believe. Thank you. So we have lots of um, positive, appreciative comments coming through in the chat. I'm going to convey a few questions together, a few empirical questions, and I can see Amalia also has her hand up. So let me convey these questions from the chat. And you can answer them and then I'll give Amalia an opportunity to ask a question. Um, so Stephen asks, to begin with, can you just talk about the Nazi rationale for per persecuting the Roman Sinti? Um, he asks, was it the Aryan myth, their homelessness, religion, and so on? Um, there is also um, another question about victim groups. Can you say a little bit about what other um, what other victim groups were um, were targeted? Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a comment and a question early on um, from Joseph Capo, who says he met you at the Holocaust Museum in New York last May, um, mm -hmm. and he his question is how many Roma were let into the U.S. in the years after the war. Oh, okay. He he thanks you for all of your work. Um, let's leave it there, and there are more. Okay, so yes, one one of so so many many different questions here. Um, perhaps I should. Speak first about other victim groups. Uh, I highlight one victim group. I, I should really say that it's right. I'm, I'm not. I don't. I don't want to do this in any exclusive way. Um, clearly, there are many other stories that actually one, one should highlight. I, I, I will just highlight one other group here, which I think is, is uh, actually two other groups. Um, one is the group that really gets gets utterly marginalized, which are criminals. People who are, who are denounced as criminals, and the memory of many survivors is of, of them as, as capos. Um, 
but the way we today speak about uh, individuals who, for some reason, end up in the penal system is not as eternal criminals, first of all, right? We, we, um, the principle of not defining people by their worst moment. Um, and we understand that they don't deserve uh, to be uh, interned uh, in concentration camps uh, beyond what is the regular penal system. Um, and, and their usual right, after they end end their general after they end up being in prison, basically being released only into a concentration camp. So I think that group actually is is we want to think about what the limits are of of the debate. I think that that's one group one could mention there. Disabled uh, victims are are another absolutely essential group. I would say um, in Germany and beyond, um, and they this is where. The argument is very often actually tied to to the fate of Jews um, because they were the first group to be gassed and the methods uh, developed to murder them would eventually be transferred to, um, it would be the technology to murder Jews as well. Um, but I think they we, we should really understand them as a group in their own right, quite beyond that, that role they play in the genesis of, of the Jewish, of the Jewish Holocaust. And all these groups, I should say, as when it comes to Roma, and this perhaps gets me to the next question, there are there there's some something interrelated here. Uh, some Roma will be persecuted as so-called asocials. Those again will be will be some there will be an overlap with people called criminals. Um, there, there, so there, there's a way in which um, Roma fit into a pattern. Um, of, of what we might call two types of groups. So what, what, what we do have is indeed a racialization of uh, populations and of the way right, Germany conceptualizes itself. Jews are ultimately seen as a racialized political enemy. And this is how they are treated, but it's absolutely central for the agenda as a political enemy and a racialized enemy in that regard. Roma are also racialized. They're a racialized social enemy of the society they imagine. And it creates a slightly different dynamic. Um, I think we need to study both because both, if, if, we, if, we, if we believe in what genocide studies tells us that we should, that we're supposed to learn beyond the event. Um, I don't know if we can prevent other events, but at least think more broadly <laughs> in about what one, how one might prevent them. Then really both aspects are very often there the element of the racialized social enemy and the racialized political enemy. So yes, they would ultimately adapt their this rate of this racialized enmity also to the, the larger theories of, of Aryanhood that they have. It's a bit complicated because Roma are understood as being originally Aryan from Northern India in their migrations. So there would be ad hoc theories about the actual Roma are mixed and the more mixed they are, the more problematic they are. I would say, even though the state apparatus will sometimes elaborate on these theories, it's not what will drive all of this as much. I think it's actually much like anti-Semitism and what we understand now that that Nazis will have all sorts of theories about Jews and non-Aryans and you know, Semites and Aryans, but really they are fairly eclectic in their anti-Semitism. Uh, they are absolutely happy if you want to be a religious anti-Semite and don't believe their race theory, as long as you're part of the larger project, they're good with it. The same is true, I would say, for Roma. There's an understanding that they are enemies of the sort of society that they want to create, that they are, you know, basically, if you want genetically, uh, predisposed to be criminals and problematic. Um, and then there are multiple theories that can attach to that. But if somebody just says, you know, I, I'm just a municipal officer who wants to clean up the city, but I don't believe any of that, they're totally fine with that. That that's not that, that still makes them part of that larger family, if you want, of in, in of, of, of the bureaucrats in the racial state. Um, and then there was uh what was the last question? Uh oh, um being led into the US after the war, we don't know. Uh, there were very little migration. So the biggest, this is also part of the memory, actually. The, the question about memory, it's 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 it's, it's part to what, what, what Charlie asked me earlier. Part of the answer about, about the ability to commemorate has to do with migration. Most Jews who would survive would eventually make it to the Cold War West. Um, yes, to France, the UK to some degree, and to very large numbers to what would become Israel and, what, and, and the United States. Um, 
and that would give them access to a memory culture and the institutions there that commemorate. Uh, much harder in what would be the Cold War East, and most Roma will not leave the Cold War East. This is where they will still ultimately live. So it, there's much less of a history of that migration. There will be various migrations with their neighbors, which is generally their migration history, also of Jews, I should say, usually migrate. Central European Jews migrate with their with their neighbors uh, to a large degree as, as Russian Jews. Um, so, for example, Yugoslav immigration to, um, to Western Europe, to uh, Germany, but also to the United States, um, will also include Romani communities then. So there are Macedonian Romani communities in the Bronx, say. Um, and they, they, you know, they come from the time when other Macedonians emigrated, basically. Um, ultimately, there is a wonderful historian at the University of Michigan uh, who is looking into the history of uh, the Roma in New York, which will be one of the first times really that we have a proper history of Roma in the United States. They are really, this is part of the larger issue that I mentioned, I'm really grateful that we are finally highlighting their fate under the under the Nazis and their allies. It's a larger European story, but really the 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 we, there's so much to be learned about their larger history, um, including in the United States, where they are they are deeply invisible, where they're a large group, uh, but 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 really profoundly invisible. Thank you for all the work that you do and and colleagues who are working on this um, on that front. Um, it is already past eight, but Amalia has very uh, patiently been sitting there with her hand up. So I'm going to let her speak and apologies to everyone else whose questions um, we can't answer. Um, I'm going to ask Amalia to unmute if you can. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, my mother was Hungarian and until she actually met a Roma that my uncle brought home from the university, they had been taught to be afraid of them, that they were children snatchers and, and you know, just not people that you, they were dangerous people. How did that reputation develop? I think, so So one thing I look at also in my book is is, is, is Yiddish literature and including children's literature. And this is, so the, the images of the tzigaina would, would be the Yiddish term. Um, and and it, it's it's sort of ubiquitous as well, um, but also positive, it's, it's always mixed. It's fascinating, uh, you know, there's a romantic image, they're free, but they're also dangerous. Um, the, I have a testimony even from a ghetto where, you know, there's this projection of, of instead of the Nazis abducting the children, it's, it's just the gypsies coming to abduct the children in the night, you know, when, when children are afraid and can't frame things correctly in, in their mind. Um, ultimately, and what, what I conclude here is that, uh, Jews will share the same ideas as their neighbors about Roma. So... These are myths that are in society. They're not in any way peculiar to Jews. So, right, this, this would be they and their non-Jewish Hungarian neighbors basically shared a folklore here. The same would be true about anti-Semitism among Roma, I would say. Um, many Roma will have the same ideas about Jewish power and influence and nefarious, uh, their, their nefarious activities um, as, as their neighbors. Um, they are, you know, neither the, the fact that one is persecuted next to each other basically doesn't doesn't necessarily i mean there's, there's a potential there that, that i want to highlight too but but it doesn't it's not automatic there is nothing that just you know makes you aware of all the prejudices in the world <laughs> and, and and in that sense it's if if anything a, a call to uh, to 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 labor <laughs> and to to the labor of solidarity if you want rather than to it just happening thank you what a, what a great note on which to end. Thank you so much again, Ari, on behalf of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center. Um, and it's clear from the very appreciative comments in the chat that we have all learned a lot from you. Um, I've, I've popped again in the chat a little reminder about those about how to buy the book for those of you who are interested in finding out more about it. It's highly recommended. Also a quick reminder about our next event. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Isabel Seddon about her new book, Intrepid Pioneers which looks at the contributions of Jewish women in Britain. And that's going to be in person in London for those of you who, who can make it and are interested. Um, and there will be many more online events as well coming soon. So thank you so much again and hopefully see you all very soon. Take care. Thank you so much.